Today, I am watching Wild Reads. Here he is, doing his May TBR. Say hello to- Ah! Ha, ha. Say hello to the internet, Biggie. To your adoring audience. You have a large platform today, because lots of people watch my wrap-ups. Do you have anything to say to all the people, Biggie? Get me out of here! Okay, should I let you down? Let me- Whoa! Oh, we've got to get your claws cut, haven't we? Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my April 2018 reading wrap-up. It has been a busy month, so you may have seen in my haul video, which I guess I'll link to below, that I got the Penguin uh, Mini Modern Classics box set. So because of that, I have like an artificially high reading count because they're all quite thin. Let me show you. Here is the typical width of one of those books. So I can get quite a few of those in in a month. Although I didn't actually read that one this month. Quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. There are a lot of books, so this is going to be a long video. I just want to say thank you as always to new subscribers and old subscribers alike. And everyone who always comments on my videos, I really appreciate it. it makes it a lot of fun. A guy just walked past the window staring at me, wondering why I'm sitting in a suit in a living room with big pointy lights and a camera. I've almost hit 1500 subscribers and in fact I may have done that by the time this goes up. I don't know. But basically when that happens we are going to have a Q&A and also a blooper video so that'll be very exciting so look forward to that soon. And yes, I'll also let you know if I've reviewed these books separately to this video, and if so, they will be linked to below. I almost forgot something. Shout out to Todd the Librarian. It is actually only 3pm at the moment. This is a 5.2% beer, but what the hell? Perks of being self-employed. Oh, the other thing to mention is I'm wearing a suit because that is now my tradition. Every wrap-up, I'm going to wear a suit. I don't know, if you want me to wear a suit more often, let me know in the comments below. I, I probably could. Maybe not for every video, but certainly for some of them. So that might be fun. Who knows? I'm also wearing a green tie to represent Slytherin. Yeah. Look, there's a Slytherin thing on the wall. You can't quite... It's behind my booktube sign. We're not going to get it. I actually tried opening the door for like the first ever time since I've been doing booktube. And yeah, it doesn't work. Let me go and open the door. I'll show you what I mean. Look. It's outside. But it just it just glows. On the Harry Potter theme, here is a wand. ASIO Books. Wow. That magic really worked. Oh, by the way, this is a stack of books. This is this is only half of the books. So we're going to get through these and then we're going to go and get through the other half. The first book that I picked up this month was The Trader of Saigon by Lucy Crookshanks. So Lucy is one half of Book Axe here on Booktube. They actually have a bookaxe.com website, which I describe as being like Tinder for books, basically. I mean, Scott, who is her husband, he has this grand goal of, of wanting to take down Goodreads and fair play to them. Good luck on that mission. But anyway, Lucy is also an author, and this is her first book. It's basically... I don't know how you... It's like a almost historical fiction, except it's like the 1970s or something. I think it's the 1970s. 1980s. Uh, so whether that counts as historical fiction or not, I'm not sure. But it's set in Vietnam, and there are kind of people trafficking, people smuggling elements to it. A guy called Fuck... I like that name. I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce it, but I, I just keep pronouncing it fuck because it gives me a great excuse to say fuck without actually saying fuck. So fuck bets in a gambling match and loses his daughter, which is very clumsy of him. And uh, yeah, the, the rest of this book kind of follows that story really. And I enjoyed this. I think I gave this a four out of five. Uh, there's a full review of it down below as well. I read this for Todd and Danes Indie Read Along. This is my new drinking game that every time I mention Todd the Librarian, I have to take a swig of beer. You should subscribe to Todd if you haven't already. I love his channel. It's great. Yeah. In fact, I'm reading his book. I'm literally currently reading his book. Yeah. Okay, the second book that I read in April was Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. I read this as a buddy read. Please don't ask me to name who I read it with because... I, I named who I read, who I read it with in, in the video review I did of it. Still got it wrong. So I named it in the raw footage, got it wrong, tried to correct it in editing with a caption over it, and still got it wrong. So, 
So apparently I have no idea who I buddy read this with. So this is Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. It's a thriller, it's Flynn's first book. I mean, I did not like Gone Girl, did like The Grown Up, didn't really like Sharp Objects to be honest. There were some really weird bits in this. One thing that I didn't mention in the review, which is linked to you below, but I realised afterwards that I hadn't mentioned it. Is this really weird scene where the main character, who's like this journalist, he's like 30 or whatever, and she comes back home and then she takes de she takes ecstasy with her 13-year-old little half-sister. And I'm just like, that is really irresponsible. Number three was from Quirkus Books. This is Poems for a World Gone to Shit. Now, my problem with this book is that it didn't really live up to the title. It was basically just a generic poetry collection of bits like Wordsworth and maybe the odd Shakespeare sonnet. You know, it did get some recent poets, like I think Kate Tempest was in there, but quite a lot of it as well was just this really old school style of poetry that I've never been a fan of anyway. And I just think if you're gonna have a title like Poems for a World Gone to Shit, you need some poetry in there that's actually gonna, you know, push the envelope or whatever it is that the, the current jargon is for innovation, you know, even innovation is bloody jargon, but anyway, you know what I mean, it just felt, it just felt like a bunch of old white dudes complaining, and, I don't know, I wanted, I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that from a book with this title, from Quirkus as well, I thought it was going to be a little bit more original, but it was just your bog standard poetry collection. Okay, then we have Penguin Mini Modern number 02, I read them slightly out of order for reasons that I don't really want to go into here. <laughs> It's to do with my really obsessive approach to reading, so I read one book by an author who's new to me, then one by an author who isn't, and so on and so forth. It's, it's too long to explain in this video. But anyway, this is Television Was a Baby Crawling Toward That Death Chamber by Allen Ginsberg, and these are basically just some of Ginsberg's poems. I'm a big fan of Ginsberg's, really. What I did say in this one was that a lot of it was his stuff on sexuality, and uh, Mark Nash actually commented on one of my videos pointing out that for Ginsberg, sexuality was political. But for me as a modern reader, I just had no interest in it whatsoever. I mean, that poem's like, I hope my good old asshole holds out. 60 years it's been mostly okay. And I don't know, I, I just think that's, I, if that wasn't Ginsberg, it is best for me. So I think I gave this 3.5 out of 5. It had some decent poems, but it also had some of the poems that Ginsberg wrote that I just don't have much time for, to be honest. This one. And also this one, these are reviewed in an Archive 5 video I did of the first five of these penguins. So, um, yeah, the next few are also included in that as well. This is Martin Luther King Jr., letter from Birmingham Jail. It also includes a sermon that he gave called The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. Just phenomenal, really. This is a great way to start because this is penguin number 01. And a lot of what King says is still relevant today and even the stuff that kind of isn't relevant you need to know about it, if that makes sense. So I would recommend this one, actually. E even if you only pick up one or two of these Penguin m uh, Mini Moderns, this is probably one of the better ones to get. I think I gave it a 4 a, or a 4.5. Editing Dane will take his pick. Okay, then we have Clockwork Angel by Cassandra Clare, and this was a buddy read. I read this with Kit Kats Can Read, Damien Tariquez, Lisa's West Coast Reads, Sophisticated Books, and I think that's it. And this is uh, Infernal Devices Book 1. So I've read the first three Mortal Instruments books, and so this was obviously going to a new little series, and I really didn't like this. Uh, I, I think this is the, the worst of the four of her books that I've read yet. And I just thought it was, it was almost an insult to Victorian London, the fact that it's supposed to be set there, but it reads as though it's set in pr pr present day New York City, pretty much. I think it's, Cassandra Clare clearly wrote this after hearing about sort of steampunk and cyberpunk, and not really understanding it. Having read a bunch of books that are actually set in Victorian England, I just think that this is not good. It, like, the no, the world, the world building or whatever. It, it focused all on the world building of the Shadowhunters, etc. And just sort of swept the Victorian England thing under a carpet. And that's what made me want to read it in the first place. So, also the characters in it are basically just the same characters from the previous book. I didn't like any of them as well. So... A lot of like the twists and turns and stuff fell flat and like the whole love plot or whatever. Well, I don't care. I hope all these people get hit by a handsome cab, except that probably won't happen because I don't think Cassie Clare even knows what the fuck they are. I don't know why I gave that. Maybe 2 or a 2.5 out of 5. I'm going to drink some beer from that. That has also made me question whether I want to continue to read her books. But I think I'm just going to do it because I want to know what people are talking about, you know. 
Then we have The Book of Riga, a city in short fiction, edited by Eva Eglaja Christone and Becca Parkinson. And I was sent this for review by Becca Parkinson, actually. And it's just a collection of Latvian short stories that have all been translated into English and pulled together into this little book, really. So inside we have uh, Paul Pauls Bankowskis, who I think I mentioned in my previous wrap-up. I read a book called 18 by him. We also have Ilza Jansson, Arno Junza. Gundega Rep, so basically loads of people in here. We also have an introduction by Vera Vika Freiberger, who was uh, the president of the Republic of Latvia and their first female president as well. So, you know, Latvia, ahead of you Americans, just, just saying. Mind you, our first female and only female, actually no, we've got Theresa May, haven't we? I forgot about that, but our first female prime minister was Margaret Thatcher. We get political in these videos, don't we? It's great, it's good. All right, let's continue getting political with a play by Hallam Bennett, The History Boys. And this, I don't know, it was hard for me to relate to it in a sense because these are all these are all sixth form boys at a British boarding school and I never went to boarding school and I did go to sixth form but I dropped out after about two months because it was shit. I ended up going to college instead. So <laughs> I found it hard to actually relate to the situations they were in. I also don't like the fact that James Corden is on the cover because he was in the opening run of the play and I don't like James Corden even though he used to live in High Wycombe which is where I live. But anyway all that aside it was a very good play. What's, what's great about Bennett's work is that he's just fantastic at writing dialogue and he's just very very funny and sort of sharp, biting, incisive and I really like that and it worked really well in this so I gave this a four out of five. Next up we have Daphne du Maurier, The Breakthrough. This is number three in the Penguin Mini Moderns. This is actually my first Daphne du Maurier read as well. I actually regret it's taken me this long to get into du Maurier. I do actually have Rebecca, my cousin Rachel, and Frenchman's Creek. I also have Frenchman's Creek. So I do have three of her books that I own that I just haven't got to yet. And I don't know, I was planning on getting to Rebecca pretty soon, and then when I just saw this was number three in the Penguin Mini Moderns, I was like, do you know what, that's actually the perfect way to get to know her. I will be reading Rebecca in May. I'm buddy reading it with sophisticated books, so shout out to Sophie. The really good short stories, I really enjoyed them. I thought it was a great way to get to know De Maurier. Four out of five for me. Okay, then next up we have Bill Bryson's African Diary. I don't really... Oh, I know why I picked this up. It was because, again, because of my weird way of alternating between new-to-me authors and existing authors. De Maurier was new to me, and I wanted to just read something short from an, an author I'd read before so I could get to the next one in The Penguins. <laughs> So that's why I read a short one here, and uh, yeah, it's just quite fun. I mean, this is in partnership with Care International. I think all royalties from it go to Care. Bit of a bummer because I picked it up from a charity shop, but whatever, at least the money I paid for it did go to charity. It was fine. I mean, it wasn't particularly exciting. There were some pictures, though, which kind of brought it to life a bit. I mean, it was fine. It wasn't Bill Bryson's best, but, you know, it wasn't awful. 3.5 out of 5. All right, that allowed me to get back to those Penguin Mini Moderns. So here's number four, and that's Dorothy Parker, The Custard Heart. And again, first time I've ever read Dorothy Parker. My main lasting impression from this is that she she just writes about people getting drunk. She's like a female Charles Bukowski. Now, I even said in my review of this, I think, because this is, again, one of the ones in my Archive 5 of these Penguin Mini Moderns. And I think I said in my review, I was like, I don't know if she was an alcoholic, but she reads as though she was. So, anyway, I mean, I like books about drinking, really. So, so I think I gave it a 4 out of 5. And, again, it's my first experience with Dorothy Parker. And it did make me want to read more. So, I guess that's a sign of the quality of these penguins, whether they did make me want to read more or not. Okay, next up we have Truman Capote, Summer Crossing, and I actually picked this up when I went to Oxford with Becca a little while back. I'll link below to our little travel video if you want to travel to Oxford with us. And uh, yeah, this was, you can see there's a sticker on it, two for five pounds, so I bought a bunch of these. And uh, it was from a shop that used to be an HMV, but obviously HMV went into administration, so it was just called like ABC Books or something. And had, you know, it was still an HMV, it still had all the music CDs and the vinyls and the t-shirts and everything. It was really weird. But anyway, this is Truman Capote's Lost Novel. It actually, people knew it had existed because of his letters and journals and all that stuff, but they didn't know where it was. And then it cropped up for auction. And basically the Capote Society or whatever they're called, the, the ones who handle all of his, you know, literary estate, they kind of stake the claim saying, you know, the actual text of it belongs to us. 
because it belonged to Capote and all of his literary estate belongs to us. However, the actual physical object, the manuscript belonged to, you know, whoever owned it, I think. And this is kind of billed as like a precursor to Breakfast at Tiffany's. It was really good, actually. It was basically about... I think the reason I liked it was because of what it was about. It was about like the a society, a socialite entering society in, uh, oh, what do they call it? They, they're coming out, you know, not as, I, I wonder actually whether that's where like the whole gay scene slang of coming out comes from because it was slang in the 1930s or 40s or whatever just for, you know, a young woman who went out into society and signaled her availability. And this book is basically about that type of coming out, I suppose. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, it wasn't amazing, but it was a nice little snapshot of history. And I'm glad this book didn't go, you know, just lost forever. I think, again, a four out of five. There may be some disparity between how I rate these books in individual reviews and on Goodreads and how I rate them in these wrap-ups. But um, I don't know. In the wrap-ups, I don't have a list of what I rated them. I just go off memory. So every now and then I get it slightly wrong. But I'm giving you a vague... Vague approximation of uh, what I thought of them via the form of a rating. Which, after all, isn't that what ratings are all about anyway? Mm. Cheers, Todd. Okay, and then we have Penguin Mini Modern number 5. And this is the last of the five that are included in the Archive 5 video of reviews below. This is Akutagawa and Others, three Japanese short stories. Honestly, I can't even, I mean, it's been about two weeks and I can't remember much I could tell you about these stories. They didn't leave much of a lasting impact, unfortunately. I think they were fine. They were interesting, actually, to see kind of a vision of Japanese society in, say, the 1950s or whatever. But, I mean, I wouldn't read more of any of these authors. It is what it is. I think uh, three out of five for this one. All right, then we have, I'm proud of this one. This one, I started reading this in about July. <laughs> This is Homer the Odyssey, and I was sent this by Oxford University Press. This is actually their specific edition of it and their translation. It's in this beautiful sort of stitched hardback. I really enjoyed this, actually. I mean, like I say, it took me forever. What I did was I had it as my bedtime book, and I was reading 10 pages a night. It took me eight months <laughs> or whatever, but it was super enjoyable. It was just super dense. I think in the end, I gave it a four out of five. The problem with it is how do you rate something like the Odyssey, which is just undeniably import important to like civilization as we know it. I mean, it's the kind of book I think every serious reader should read once in their lives. However, I mean, I'm not calling you a, a not a, I'm not saying you're not a serious reader if you haven't read it yet. You can save it for your retirement, you know? But um yeah, I read it as my bedtime book and and did thoroughly enjoy it. I would recommend it if you haven't read it. The next book that I finished was also a chunker, I guess, and that was Agatha Christie, an autobiography, and I read this with books like Woe. I think she read this in one day, which blows my mind. I read it in about four, but you can kind of see here, tiny, tiny print there, and, and it's uh, about, yeah, nearly 600 pages long, but oh my goodness, was this good. I mean, yeah, she didn't really write too much about her individual books, but then she has so many of those, I suppose... That, w that would be all there would be room for, you know. So what this is great for is actually showing the society that she lived in and kind of grew up in and worked in. I think it's fascinating as well that she didn't really see herself as an author. She saw herself as a housewife who wrote books, which I guess is a sign of the times, you know. I mean, all in all, just a fascinating book. Uh, I did say, well, we when we were talking about the buddy read, we were like, I can't imagine any other booktubers who might want to read it, though. You'd have to either really love Agatha Christie or really love autobiographies. But either way, if you enjoy either of those things, definitely check it out. And I filmed a review for this, which probably isn't up yet, because it's taken forever to edit, because it's an over an hour of raw footage, because there is that much to say about this book. So we'll move swiftly on. But I think I gave it a 4 out of 5, maybe a 4.5 out of 5. On to the next batch of Penguin Mini Modern, so number six, we have Anais Nin, The Veiled Woman. Just no, I gave her two out of five. Now, the problem is, is actually, the, the writing and the stories themselves are pretty good until you get to the sex scenes. <laughs> and bear in mind, she's meant to be, uh, it says here, uh, one of the greatest writers of erotic fiction. My goodness, she loves to say his sex or her sex when she's referred to genitalia to the point where I think there was one page like and bear in mind these aren't big pages look at the print like that's all you're getting on a page and I counted I think 14 times 
she had said his sex or her sex. And for me, that's just one of the things that's an instant turnoff in erotica for me. Like saying moist or quim. Like, how can I take it seriously? I cannot take it seriously. My hands travel upwards to her heavy breasts, caress them. She begins to moan a little. Now her hands travel downwards and join mine in caressing her own sex. She likes to be touched at the mouth of her sex, below the clitoris. She touches the place with me. It is there I would like to push it in a penis. Not necessarily mine, I guess. And move until I make her scream with pleasure. I put my tongue at the opening and push it in as far as it will go. I take her ass in my two hands, like a big fruit, and push it upwards. And while my tongue is playing there in the mouth of her sex, my fingers press into the flesh of her ass, travel around its firmness, into its curve, and my forefinger feels the mou little mouth of her anus and pushes in gently. Suddenly, Mary gives a start, as if I touched off an electric spark. Isn't that a YA cliche there as well? She moves to enclose my finger. I press it farther, all the while moving my tongue inside of her sex. She begins to moan, to undulate. However, if she hadn't repeatedly used the phrase his sex slash her sex, probably would have been pretty good. I actually like the setup to the stories, and then people start banging, and then suddenly it's like, oh, Jesus. Like, it's like as though you watch the first five minutes of, like, Apocalypse Now, and then just suddenly it just turns into a porn film, and you're just like... Oh. Okay, then we have Gertrude Stein food. Now this has a lot of bad reviews <laughs> and I think it's because people don't understand who Gertrude Stein is before going into her book. Like Gertrude Stein is one of the most avant-garde writers in history I think, especially considering the time she was writing. I mean it was like 1920 or whatever and um, I mean let me read you something. This is a poem called Custard. Custard is this. It has aches. Aches when? Not to be. Not to be narrowly. This makes a whole little hill. It is better than a little thing that has mellow, real mellow. It is better than lakes, whole lakes. It is better than seeding. The end. So, people are like, this sounds like a hipster's poetry from some creative writing class. And what they fail to realise is that it, the entire genre of like experimental hipsterish poetry came about because Gertrude Stein was writing like that in 1910 when everybody else was trying to copy like Wordsworth and Keats and stuff like I don't think you can write off a book because you don't like it because of experimental tone or whatever when it's so influential like Stein for me is I wouldn't say she's a favorite poet but I'm so glad she existed because without Gertrude Stein I couldn't write the poems that I write for example, I have a poem called Univocalisms, which it uses a form of poetry in which it only uses one vowel. So it's like, had a grab manner, back sad and grand and all apparent, had a ask and ass and canvas lands that span, grass and sand, and her sex needs respect. She entered reckless spectres, wrench wenches senseless, elected renders bent, brood egress, wet and trench, welded west, red defected, engendered, tested, resplendent end. Is it Ifrit's limit? His instincts elicit intrinsic. Is Ifrit sinking, shilling in mini triffids, pinching, crinkling Britishisms? Go goodly or bold, got polar. Those who told old dogs off, who sold gold on cold folds of thongs. Hop on bottom, smoky rooms of cosmos, who go to moon rooms, snowy owls, sorry. Guns, drugs, bulls, ghouls, mulch up, burnt surplus. Pump fulcrums, plum crunch, stun, frumpy drunks for cup uncut, unhurt but stung. Fun, sun, dumbstruck. You are welcome. <laughs> and uh, But I wouldn't be able to write poems like that if Gertrude Stein didn't exist. So I'm giving this a four out of five. I actually really enjoyed it anyway. Next up we have Dogtown by Louise Pastore, illustrated by Rainus Petersons. Rainus Petersons I've actually met and he drew me a fridge magnet, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this is Latvian literature, it's published by Firefly Press, which is a Welsh press, it's obviously translated into English. And it's really cool actually, it's middle grade, and it's basically about this kid who moves to this part of Riga, where there are all of these talking dogs, and then they have to, like, he teams up with the dogs to try and fight the redevelopment of this area. And we have all these cool illustrations, like these maps, and the map actually goes, like, plays part of the story as well. And, uh, yeah. I will actually be posting five reviews of Latvian literature if I haven't already. And whenever I post that, this will be in it as well. Uh, it's a new release as well. I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was very cute. I wouldn't necessarily read it if, if you're a full-grown adult and 
don't really do kids books but if you do have children I would definitely consider reading this to them as a bedtime story and I gave it a 4 out of 5. So I thought I would take a break from the Penguin Mini Moderns and I read a vintage Mini Modern or whatever and this is Desire by Haruki Murakami this is a collection of short stories all around the theme of desire I have read some Murakami before but I would say this is probably one of the better ways to get to know him as a writer really really enjoyed these stories and what I particularly liked is it's not all sexual desire uh, one of them is the desire for food for example and I mean it's just undeniably Murakami it, it kind of amazes me to be honest that as an author he has such a easily recognizable writing style in English like this was translated by about four different people yeah Jay Rubin Ted Goosen and Philip Gabriel definitely just felt all as though it was Murakami writing in English as his first language and I just think that's a testimony I just think that's a testament to how good he is as a writer and uh, yeah I would recommend this if you're new to his stuff I think I might even up my rating on this one to a 4.5 out of 5. Very good. Then we have Stanislav Lem, The Three Electro Knights. And basically Lem is kind of a giant of science fiction, of classic sci-fi. What weirds me out is that Lem is in this 50 book collection and Isaac Asimov isn't. I, I don't know about that. I think that's a bit, throwing a bit of shade at Asimov there, but... You know, Graham Greene isn't in this 50 book collection either, and I'm like, what the hell? These stories kind of reflect the society in which they were written, but also still reflect our modern society. I think if you're a sci-fi fan, Lem is a must read. I really enjoyed them, 4 out of 5 for me, and uh, yeah, I want to read more of his work actually. Alright, then we have this month's audiobook, which I read for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. Although, is that still a thing? Because obviously he's changed his channel now. And like all the videos gone and stuff, I'm still doing it until the end of the year, but I don't know if anyone else is still participating. Whatever. Anyway, in April, the book ad was The Shining. Posted a full review of this on my channel, so I'll link to that below. I still had the same problems that were the reason why I picked this up in the first place. So basically, April's challenge was to read a book you had, uh, reread a book you had mixed feelings about. And The Shining was my first ever Stephen King book, and I didn't enjoy it much. I thought it was just too full of black stuff. Black story. <laughs> I'm not talking about Dick Halloran. That was a slip of the tongue. I am not a racist. I have black friends. <laughs> Why do people say that? <laughs> As though that makes any difference. What was I talking about? The Shining. That's right. <laughs> so, I reread it because it was my first King book. And it, it did kind of put me off his work. It took me a couple of years to come back. And then I got then hooked. I think I read The Green Mile and then was like, Whoa, this dude can write. So... I, I do have those mixed feelings, and I went back and reread it, and I, I think exactly what I thought of it before the reread. It was exactly what I was expecting. So that also puts me, like, that strikes me full of fear because at some point I have to reread Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf as a book I hated. And if I was indifferent about this book and had mixed feelings, and still do, I'm not going to enjoy that reread of Miss Dall Mrs. Dalloway, am I? But yeah, I'll link below to the full review of this. I mean, it's not a bad book. And King at his worst is better than most people at their best. But it, it, it it's, it's just not the King book for me. And uh, 3.5, that's what I gave it. Then we have George Orwell, Notes on Nationalism. Probably the best Penguin Mini modern so far. Just, just buy this. 5 out of 5 immediately. These are essays from Orwell on the nature of nationalism. But he also covers things like patriotism, sports. So he talks about how having a big football match between England and Russia is probably a bad idea if it's 1948. You know. <laughs> These are all written in 1945. And so they're kind of relevant to the Second World War. But actually reading them now, they're still just as relevant as ever. I mean, oh my god. Some of his insights in this are just so biting, so true, so relevant. You just have to read this now, please. In fact, let's start doing, I'm going to start doing a new part of the of the wrap up where at the end I will do my best book of the month. And at the moment it's that, so unless it gets beaten. Next up we have Charles Bukowski, The Most Beautiful Woman in Town. These are short stories by Bukowski, who's one of my favourite authors. I will admit, basically the reason I read this is that I'm just trying to finish off his books now. I've read most of them. Uh, Becca got this for my birthday last year, and it's just been lying around. And so I thought I should finally pick it up. And I did enjoy it. It wasn't his best. I mean, I personally, I think I prefer Bukowski's poetry to his fiction anyway. But as a collection of short stories, it's not bad. I think I gave it a 4 out of 5. Because, well, it's good. I mean, it's good. It's just, 
it's not Bukowski's best, you know. Okay, then we have Patrick Kavana, the Great Hunger. He's an Irish poet. Never heard of him before, actually, I don't think. And I was reading this, and I was like, wow, he's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I said, actually, in my review, I think that the main thing I can give you about this book is that it's like a bridge between classical and modern poetry. For me, I find that you've got your classical rhyming poetry and you've got your modern contemporary poetry and nothing much in between. And and this is probably one of the few things that I've read that could fall between. Anyway, next up I read Horrible Histories, Frightful First World War by Terry Deary, illustrated by Martin Brown. This actually turned out to be a reread and I didn't even realise it. I finished reading it, went to put it on my bookshelves and then realised I already had it. So I'm keeping this edition and getting rid of my old battered edition. I actually got this from the pound shop. Horrible Histories books are great anyway. I just thought it was a great way to learn more about the First World War. And I find the war, the First and the Second World War, very fascinating. Even though I'm an adu adult and this is aimed at kids, I still very much enjoyed it. I would recommend it if you want to learn more about the war. Or if you have kids and they want to learn more about the war. This one was a 4 out of 5. Cheers, Todd. Okay, next up we have Tangerine Sky, Poems from Malta, edited by Terence Portelli. I picked this up uh, from the Malta stand at London Book Fair, and I'll link below to my visit of London Book Fair as well if you want to check that out. Basically, it's just a collection of poetry translated from Maltese into English. I enjoyed it. Will I be checking out any more poetry by any of these individual authors? No, I don't think so. My problem is that they were as good as your typical poet who's writing in English, which is great. But poetry and the poetry market is so fiercely competitive. Do they stand out above... You know, you, you guys know how many poetry books I read in a year. Do, do these poets stand out? They don't stand out as being either bad or good. They were they were fine. I think I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It's like, you can't even find this online anyway, so you can't buy a copy of it. All right, Horrible Histories, Woeful Second World War. I enjoyed this more than the First World War book, but this is just me with my inherent bias here because I find the Second World War more interesting than the First World War, I guess. I know it's awful to talk about wars where, you know, between the First and Second World War, I'm sure over 100 million people died. But actually, I think the Spanish flu killed more than either of the individual wars and possibly more than both of them, I don't know. But anyway, I don't know, I just really enjoyed this book. I enjoyed the other one, but this one was my favourite of the two. This one is a 5 out of 5 for me. Alright, then we have Christina Ehin, On the Edge of a Sword. This is poetry from Estonia, translated by Ilma Letper. Christina Ehin, I mean, she's not super old. She might be maybe 5 years older than me, something like that. She has like 10 books out, and I read this, and this was very good, actually. This one did stand out to me above the English poets, and so I do want to read some more of her work, and I think she has a few from this publisher, which is ARC Publications. So I'm going to be looking out for some more by Christina Ehin. And also, I like the fact that, as well as liking this book, I mean, it's been translated, so if I like the book, it means I kind of thought the translator did a good job as well. And so, I'm excited because the translator and the author have actually worked together for a long time, like they've worked together on multiple books. I gave this a 4 out of 5. Uh, possibly a 4.5. It's getting really post-apocalyptic outside. I've been talking for so long now. We're coming up to... Yeah, we've done about 45, 50 minutes of filming. So I'll try and crunch it down as much as I can. But, but because of that, look at what's happened outside. Do you remember how bright it was? It's raining. It's freaking raining. Okay, next up I read In His Own Right and A Spaniard in the Works by John Lennon. This is actually two books in one in this binder, but it's such a beautiful kind of artifact that I just, I didn't really care too much. I also have his, his other book, which is uh, Skywriting by Word of Mouth. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I'm going to, there's some poetry and some stories and all that kind of stuff, some doodles in here. I mean... This comes back to the Gertrude Stein thing, because let me read you a little bit of one of his poems. Okay, actually, I'm going to read this short story of his called A Surprise for Little Bobby. It was Little Bobby's birthday today, and he got a surprise. His very fist was jopped off the war, and he got a birthday hook. All his life, Bobby had wanted his very own hook, and now on his 39th birthday, his players had been answered. The only trouble was they had sent him a left hook, and every Dobby knows that it was Bobby's right fist that was missing, as it were. What to do was not the only problem. Anyway, he dropped off his left hand and it fitted like a glove. My battery died, so I had to switch to my spare battery. Cheers, Todd. Wow. 
That's it, that's bit, that bit is done. I'm gonna read this other smallish poem as well. So this is I Remember Arnold. I remember Khaki Hargreaves as if it were yestermorn. Khaki Khaki Hargreaves, son of Mr. Vaughan. He used to be so grundy on him little bike. Riding on a Sunday, funny little tyke. Yes, I remember Kathy Hairbream as if twere yesterday. Kathy Kathy Hairbream, son of Mr. May. Arriving at the station, always dead on time. For his destination, now he's dead on line. Meaning he's got hit by a train or something. And so he grow and bumply till the end of time. Humpty Dumpty Bumply, son of Harry Line. Bumbledy Humbledy Bumblebee, Bumbledy Tum. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing that probably wouldn't exist if Gertrude Stein had not been writing at the time. Unfortunately, I think I enjoy Gertrude Stein's stuff more. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of this, it totally makes sense. If you're a, if you're a Lennon fan and you kind of know how his brain works, it's definitely just his brain on paper. But for both of these books, I can't give him anything more than 3.5 out of 5 each, unfortunately. And yes, I am counting this as two books, because they are two books in one bind up. And the final two books that I read are both Penguin Mini Moderns. The first is Danilo Kiss, The Legend of the Sleepers. Didn't enjoy this, two out of five. Basically a Bible retelling, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, there will be a full review of it coming soon, but it's just all of this kind of weird mysticism stuff, and it feels as though the author's trying to make you believe, and it's a bit like what I imagine the Scientology Bible is like. It's, it had that vibe, and I'm just like, why am I reading this? I even said in my review, I would rather read the Bible, and I'm an atheist, but at least if I read the Bible, I'd kind of understand Christianity a bit more. You know what I mean? It would help me to understand other people. Whereas this is like reading the Bible as an atheist in a language you don't understand. Like, you might as well, like, like I might as well not have been reading. I didn't take anything from that book. And then finally we have Ralph Ellison, The Black Ball. And this is the other way around because I thought this was fantastic. These are short stories that own voices by an African-American writer. Basically talking about what it was to be a black African-American man in 1940, 1950. And so as such, I mean it's bleak. Things like lynchings and all this kind of stuff. Uh, this one white kid throws a brick through a window I think and then blames it on the black kid. And then the black kid gets the shit kicked out of him by all of the townspeople. And you're just like, this ain't cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I would definitely be up for reading more Ralph Ellison. In hindsight, I'm going to give this a 4.5 out of 5. I think probably, yeah, I, I want to get some of, I want to get some Ralph Ellison. I want to get some more of him read before the end of the year, I think. So somebody hold me to that, please. And so we come to my book of the month. Ow. Yeah, George Orwell, Notes on Nationalism. I think that was probably a bit of a giveaway, really, wasn't it? It was great. Yeah, go read it. Okay, well, on that note, I have now been filming for 55 minutes, possibly an hour. I don't know. But I'm going to try and edit it down as much as possible. But I really do appreciate you guys for sticking with it. I know a lot of you do, and, you know, I put out a lot of long videos, and I don't know whether people want that. But it's sort of what I've got, so I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, I've got it, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it, I suppose. So that's what I'm doing today, I'm flaunting. Well, yes. So anyway, I'm just going to wrap things up now, because I'm really freaking tired of filming. I've been, in, been sitting here for ages. So, and it's also very hot in this suit. I want to go and get naked. So anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, which ones you've read, what you thought of them, etc, etc. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.